Um, thank you everybody for your time. Uh, my thank name is Tyler me. Bell. Um, I've been with Capital One for just over three years working, working in our open source program office. Hey, uh, good afternoon. So greetings from open source program office at Capital One. My name is Noreen D'Souza. I'm a product and engineering lead to help drive the open source program office mission. As part of my role, um, I get to partner with our risk, legal brand, and engineering teams across the organization and external development community about all things open. So that includes uh, use of open source components, contributing back and launching open source projects. I have been with Capital One for six years and worked in different areas wherein I had the opportunity to drive adoption on a DevOps and you build it your own uh, methodologies. And one thing is very apparent, uh, partnership and collaboration is key to meeting um, your strategic goals. And you will hear more about this throughout our presentation. I'm excited to be here along with my colleague, Tyler. Awesome, thanks, Noreen. So folks, I wanna open up with a quote from uh, Red Hat State of Enterprise Open Source Report. Um, and it's that 86% of IT leaders say that the most innovative companies are using enterprise open source. Around 2015, uh, Capital One declared that they wanted to operate more like a tech company. Um, and uh, the, the quote that I'd like to share is that um, even though we are not a traditional technology company, we'd like to build the kind of bank that a technology company would build. Uh, and when you see statistics like these, you can understand why open source is so critical to that mission. So with that, I'll pass this over to Noreen to go over a brief history of open source at Capital One and our technology journey. Thanks, Tyler. So you may already know that Capital One is one of the largest digital banks with regional footprints in the US and has a large credit card portfolio in the US, Canada, and UK with millions of accounts. You may not be aware of, but Capital One is a founder-led technology company. From the day we were found, Capital One has been disruptive in many ways. So open source and DevOps have contributed to that success despite the regulated industry in which we operate. So our journey is a marathon to becoming a well-managed open source company. We first had to learn to crawl, walk and, and then run. So what did all, when and how did it all start, right? Open source is a shiny object, hard to resist offers benefits that go beyond the cost of developing it. So what did your strategy look like, right? You might be all thinking. So we met with different companies, survey the landscape to understand the industry benchmarks and put together a strategy that which we call open source PSP that stands for policy standard and Pro procedure document that is laid out from soup to nuts. In other words, a manifesto on our strategy to embrace open source in a responsible way at Capital One. So did we get this right the first time? Of course not. We also started uh, with a not so perfect process and iterated through it over time. So in 2013, we started with a manual approval from legal and security to use open source software and had mostly waterfall deployments. In other words, we were crawling literally, and with our manual processes. So between 2015 and 2019, we focused on scaling DevOps on our continuous and on our continuous delivery pipeline um, and improved our releases frequency to 10 plus a day for some applications, built and deployed on public cloud using microservices architecture. We announced open, uh, open source first and cloud first, led innovations, contributed externally and launched open source projects. So in a highly regulated environment, if you're not doing continuous delivery, then our belief is that you're not compliant enough. So to reduce vulnerabilities and license violation, you must release incrementally and in a small batches. So throughout this journey, we measured, improved, matured, partnered and collaborated in our practices as a result today, we're able to enhance the quality of our controls within our CICD pipeline, double down on our contributions externally and make Capital One a stronger player across the tech industry, which has led to interesting development outside Capital One and Tyler will go with them. Thanks Noreen. Uh, folks, as Noreen mentioned, um, we've been able to open source a number of projects um, from Capital One developers. 
Two of those projects are our flagship products, Cloud Custodian and Hygieia. And Cloud Custodian is a rules engine that helps you manage your AWS resources. Hygieia is a DevOps metrics dashboard that helps teams value stream the effectiveness of their DevOps. And in addition to these projects, we have about 20 additional projects in the Capital One GitHub. And we've seen literally thousands of contributions from our engineers uh, to hundreds of projects outside of Capital One. So um, we're really proud that we've been able to include external contribution as part of the BAU for our developers at Capital One. And I'll pass this back to Noreen to talk about some of our partners. Yeah, so what is key to our success, right? And that is the talk um, is all focused about. Partnerships in open source, the friends you don't know you had, we call them the Avengers. Um, jokes apart. So how many of you all have had instances where you, your risk or legal partners have concerns and you had to pull back your release? So we faced that too. So before open source program office was established, our engineering teams didn't speak to legal or risk teams, but certainly had umpteen open source libraries that needed approvals prior to use or releasing them. Engineering teams didn't sit with risk or legal or brand partners to understand risk or license implications and vice versa. Legal didn't understand open source software and products were. The realization of the importance of partnership has led to the success of open source. So three things to, uh, to keep this in mind and more so as a takeaway. When you build an open source program office, you must ensure that you have the key participants um, in your IT risk who are experts in analyzing the vulnerabilities and understanding open source products you're using so that they can tell you how much risk exposure you may have. Especially it is very important in a regulated company like us. Second, the most, and I would say active participation in reviewing the open source policy standard and procedures is key. Analyzing metrics, escalating open source security and license issues is in different um, governance forums will help um, developers to stay on top of uh, remediating your vulnerabilities. And this will help strike a balance between enterprise risk and open source risk. So from a business alignment perspective, legal counsel is key organizationally with respect to open source program office as well. So it is important to identify the right legal counsel and a properly trained legal counsel to participate in your compliance and legal review activities. So your legal department is probably very risk averse as most are. The risk aversion without technical and open source compliance background can help to stifling innovation, stifling of new ideas. So the partnership is important there with the legal counsel. Believe it or not, our legal counsel have GitHub accounts, review code in GitHub, review licenses based on which the development team may think it should be, able to identify IP leaks, which in legal terms call intellectual property. So Talo will help us uh, kind of talk through the partnership uh, with the brand that we have. Sure, thanks, Noreen. So as Noreen mentioned, we're really thankful um, to have built these connections with risk and legal. And the same goes for brand as well. And specifically when it comes to our partnership with brand, we're thinking about the things we're doing outside of Capital, Capital One, i.e. contributions and our sponsored projects. Um, and in a nutshell, what brand helps us to do is those things that we're not typically good at <laughs> as a, a standard staffed open source program office. So they help us with search engine optimization. So when folks are searching for open source, they're seeing what Capital One is doing. Um, they help us with our creative. So uh, this is a great example, all things open, um, where we go to market our, our products and tell our story. Um, and, and really anything when it comes to storytelling and, and content marketing and writing, blogging, it's awesome to have a hand on, uh, for them to have a hand on that output. And I'll hand it back to Noreen. So we launched the Capital One Open Source Program Office in 2015. One year after the first open source contributions, the open source program office was really established to govern how the engineering community uses open source software and engages with the open source community. So at a high level, OSPO has three main very tactical functions carried out in partnership with risk, legal and brand partners. 
So number one, ingestion. So able to manage cybersecurity and license risk while development community is taking the advantage of open source components to build in in-house applications is key. Contribution able to manage intellectual property, legal and cybersecurity risk while engineering teams contribute back to fix bugs on the library that is being used internally as part of the proprietary code. And number three, sponsorship. Govern the launch and maintenance of Capital One open source projects while creating and launching open source project for external use. So it is very important to understand where OSPO should land in order to be effective and efficient to carry out the functions. So there are several areas where you could in instantiate an open source program office and a few things that can factor in. Um, and they are number one, depends on how centric your business is open source software to land within the line of business or open source program office could also land within a horizontal tech organization so that they it can act as a liaison between the engineering teams across the lines of business, risk, um, legal and brand. Application design groups, however, are typically going to be the, uh, the org that has the most skin in the game and are the strongest stakeholders for ensuring that you've got the open source orientation established accurately. So in addition to the open source program office tactical goals, right, um, there's also a primary and strategic responsibility. And, uh, and one is the fostering open source like culture within your organization. And anytime you talk about open source culture, it always bubbles up to the surface, right? So embracing open source methodologies that the rest of the world uses and bringing them inside your organization's corporate firewall and company's culture is important. So in other words, it's called inner sourcing. So inner source is a term coined by Tim O'Reilly to describe the use um, or adoption of the open, open source paradigm inside an organization. So it is a very important step on the journey to become mature and responsible consumer or provider of an open source at an enterprise level to instill a mindset with your software developers that they are free to use open source software and free to take the advantage of the liberties the open source provides them as long as they do so within the oversight and compliance policies of the organization whether they might be um, wh whether this might be uh, where they need that uh, whatever the policy they might be using right because one policy does not fit all so things to keep in mind, right? Um, so number one, standardization of the tools and engineering practices is important. Owning and overseeing. So OSPO is the center of the universe for seeing open source strategies and methodologies for determining how you can execute on that strategy and align across the organization to achieve that strategy. So number three, communicate and communicate be the open source evangelist, able to talk to everyone at every level from intern to the executives on what open source is and why you're using it and how you're using it, what are the advantages is also very important. Have a shared backlog of features for in-house development to promote reusing and innovations. Rather than starting from scratch with every development project, teams can modify um, existing code developed elsewhere within the organization, which helps teams to reuse application code, reducing code substantially. So a CICD pipeline development is one such example, which is built on the basis of inner sourcing and partnership with lines of business. Uh, last but not the least, recognition, reward for inner sourcing and reusing versus reinventing the wheels. Um, the picture on the right will uh, hit home when you see the two ways of developing products, uh, one is more of a mandated and one-way approach versus um, building in partnership and collaboration and sharing the same backlog with your lines of business. So as you embrace the inner sourcing culture, maintaining open source license compliance reviews and oversight, which is another key and tactical goal. And if you go to my next slide, Tyler. So as a consumer of open source projects, what are we going to do to ensure we are compliant 
with the open source licensing we are taking advantage of and to make sure that the open source components that we're using don't have security vulnerabilities. That we need to be aware of or what we can discover security vulner vulnerabilities later on if they surface um, after we begin using an open source component. So, so many questions, right? So number one, we need is a continual compliance research, a process to manage the use of open source as part of the business process inside the enterprise that provides clear decision pathways on criticality of the findings, the use of open source supported versions and remediation timelines. Number two, identify a scanning tool that fits with your CI CD pipeline and business needs to proactively scan the code and maintain a long term database of those scanned results so that you can identify which licenses are in the code and also the vulnerabilities. Number three, analyze, track, and report out security vulnerabilities and license violations to enforce best practices throughout your development lifecycle. Number four, clearly define automated controls and embed them in the process so that you can enforce remediation prior to releasing the code. And number five, continuous monitoring and audit is important to stay in compliance and use open source responsibility. So um, a, a quick kind of uh, picture on the right that shows the uh, very high level DevOps pipeline. But as you build your DevOps pipeline, remember to have the top five characteristics, automate policy rules to enforce, shift left scanning for early notification, frequent release enables speed to market and any feed, early feedback loop smaller batch size to prevent vulnerabilities and transparency is key to gaining alignment. So what are the, um, what are the risks of using open source software, right? So before we talk through the various risks of using open source software, did you know like open source was coming into your environment through a number of different avenues? For example, approved components usage, developer downloads, code reuse, commercial apps, outsource development, etc. So basically all applications contain open source and more than likely your applications are containing more open source than your proprietary code. So open source is free, right? So no initial monetary cost, uh, free as, is, as in freedom, you can use, distribute, modify the source code without asking the author permission. So it is very important to understand the risk and those obligations to ensure you are prepared that the right people are involved, right tech is used and right process is being put in place. So also like unlike commercial applications that push those updates for you, your developers are actually responsible to pulling those updates to keep it, keep your code compliant, open source code compliant. So developers are the first line of defense um, they're the ones bringing in the software and they are the ones managing it. So there needs to be a you build it, you own it mentality embedded in your culture. And what is, and it's also consistent with overall DevOps mindset too, right? So since the vulnerabilities can be found anytime and so is the breaches continue to increase, the continuous detection remediation becomes absolutely necessary. Remediation in the security world um, is to repair or upgrade to the most recent supported version that does not have the vulnerabilities. So there are also real legal risk and also to keep in mind that you need a license if you are using open source software. So that is your legal permission and you're required to adhere to the rules. Um, authors of the software have over 2000 different licenses to choose from, when you think of the licenses, then think about it in two general buckets we have, right? Permissive and copyleft. When it comes to permissive, generally the obligations are, you wanna give attribution to the author, right? You wanna give them the credit. The other end of the spectrum you have is a copyleft licenses. In certain situations, um, you not only have to distribute the uh, um, source code and show the source code of the copyleft license that you're using, but you also have to share the source code that it touches. So this is a very specific use case analysis and 
you need to be mindful of your business needs as you intend uh, using open source and the license that's associated with it. So also you're using the open source software that you are bringing in as is, meaning you have no recourse against the author from what you got in. So this can be a tricky area to explain to the engineering teams. Um, so for commercial software, you have those warranties um, and they're covered for you. However, um, not for open source. So legal counsel is um, advice. Legal counsel advice is really important uh, because legal terms can get very complicated, and this is where a close partnership uh, helps. So remediation for license can slightly differ from security license remediation. For license remediation, you can replace it with an alternative open source library or something you write yourself or use a commercial alternative. Um, however, for uh, remediations uh, for that are that could also be conditional, meaning if I use the open source uh, this way, your action potentially could be a different thing. So since it is a conditional, you can work with your legal counsel to get approval to use a certain license uh, based on the business current condition. And maybe you may get approved to use that based on your business need or the way you use it. So community health risk and transitive dependency risk, I'm gonna to touch on both together because they're sort of interrelated. It is important to ask yourself a, a couple of things, right? As you use open source software, you know, what is the age of that project? What is the, is the community strong in terms of supporting that project? When was the last commit made to this open source project? So um, in order to prevent vulnerabilities, it's important that you check the community health of the project that you want to bring into your company or you want to use as part of your application. So automated scanning tools help to identify vulnerabilities and license issues in which scenarios, um, in such scenarios. So remediation is basically for both of the of these scenarios could be like remove and replace with another open source. And if it's really important to your business needs, then contribute back and support the project, which is a good segue into my next slide on contribution. So let me tell you why it is important to contribute back to open source first. Um, in order to improve your, your risk posture, for example, fixing bugs, closing CVEs upstream to libraries that are widely used within your organization. It's very important. So to reduce the risk of being vulnerable and avoiding breaches, um, as you are taking advantage of open source, it is expected that we give back as well to the community in the form of code improvements and enhancements and launch new projects that we will touch on a bit. Um, Tala will go to, over that in much detail. So your path to contribution cannot be a bumpy road. I like to use this analogy all the time. You can see on the left hand of the uh, slide, uh, there's a picture as you drive your car on the highway, if you get toll gates, wherein you have to manually pay for it every five minutes, wouldn't you get frustrated, right? So, but if you have an easy pass, you will not mind the toll gates because you can go through without stopping, without stopping, right? Similarly, it is important that you have the right processes in place automated to prevent your organization from security and license issues, intellectual property and data lakes to support contributions upstream. So you'll be surprised how much you could save cost by contributing upstream. So do attend John Mark Walker's talk tomorrow at 12.30 PM fostering on open environment for developers in a regulated industry where he will go through the supply chain and talk in depth about why contributing upstream is important. So a bit of a sneak peek, uh, we have built a tool. It is a, a CLI command line interpreter and get hooks provider that shifts left uh, the production and uh, code pipeline quality gates um, to run before code is committed or transmitted to server. So the following checks are automated uh, as part of this process. That is sensitive data scanning, pre-approved open source license and project checks, uh, commit verifications and contribution analysis is performed to protect our developers from data exfiltration license violations and brand reputations risk. So we are in the uh, pilot phase and uh, may think to open source this product at some point. Um, so 
with that, I turn it over to Tyler Bell to talk through the process of launching our open source projects. Thanks, Corinne, um, and thank you, everybody. So I want to just talk a little bit about um, you know, the thought process that goes into launching an open source project, both from the developer's point of view and from an open source program office point of view. So here we have Steve Ballmer here, who's got this great idea. Um, maybe a project he's been working on at home, or maybe there's, it's a project inside of Capital One that we're using internally. Either way, he realizes there's some applicability outside of Capital One and wants to publicize this project as soon as possible with the goal of having widespread adoption and impact, uh, which will ultimately result in contribution back to the project, um, and then a widespread sustainable reach. So he wants to make sure that um, the project is marketed in the right channels and that the right people are seeing it so that um, he gets the proper involvement into the project. Um, so naturally, you know, as a developer typically does, right, they want to look on, you know, how to go from A to B as fast as possible. Um, as Noreen talked, you know, earlier on about who our partners are um, and how legal and risk and, and maybe even brand um, have been groups that can be a showstopper for your releases. Um, so it's natural to understand why a developer may not want to, uh, you know, reach out to those folks or engage with them prior to making their project public. Um, and not doing so can actually result in a riskier project launch and a uh, higher risk of a failed project, you know, however you want to define that. Um, <clears throat> so instead of going straight from A to B, um, we want to talk about a few things that you need to consider risk-wise before you make your project public. So there's basically three buckets of risk here, um, and it's a deeper dive of the community risks that Noreen shared earlier, in addition to some brand risks. So the first one is risk to Capital One brand. Um, and the first specific risk here that we want to avoid is producing or consuming any poor quality code. So the last thing we want to do is create a project and put it out there and tell people to use it. And then folks realize that it's full of vulnerabilities and findings and just poor quality clunky code. That's one risk we want to avoid. Um, the other one is obvious accidental sharing of NPI. Again, something non-public information, something you never want to do. Um, and then we want to avoid the risk of a lack of participation in OSS communities. So um, we talked about some of the work we're doing with contribution, why we see it as important. But in general, nobody wants to be that person who is hugely dependent upon open source software to build their products and aren't giving anything back to the community. So we don't want to be viewed in that, in that light from a brand perspective. We want to make sure that it's known that we are giving back. We want to avoid a low project ceiling. So avoiding things like inadequate marketing, depending upon uh, the size and intent of your project. We want to avoid insufficient support and insufficient roadmaps for these projects as well. Um, so we want people in the open source community to understand what the intent of the project is. Um, to see the roadmap and understand if it's something they want to get involved in, uh, you know, and give them that option early on. Um, you know, you don't want to set up a project, you know, where it's kind of gray as far as what the future is, right? Um, and we want to avoid community stagnancy as well. So avoiding a buildup of unresolved PRs and issues. If you're maintaining an open source project, um, I know it can get busy, but nobody wants to work on that project that has 100 open issues and 100 PRs open that are two years old. Um, you're going to lose contributors that way because people will get frustrated. Um, they don't want to go through all that effort of refactoring all of their code and their contributions, um, you know, that didn't get reviewed for two years. Um, so that's a no-no you want to try and avoid. Um, we also want to make sure that the community is driving the project itself. So um, it's fine to have maintainers from your company, but you also want to have folks who have real say and sway um, into uh, the, ma the maintenance of the project and the future of the roadmap. And we also want to make sure that there is a proper retirement strategy. Not every project needs to be the project that lives forever and keeps building on new features. It's okay if it solves a temporary problem, so long as folks know, know that in the beginning that this is not our intent to continue to develop this for years on end, um, as we would a more premium project. So another question you need to ask yourself is what's the intent of the project? And we see a lot of projects come through and we see, you know, some of them are software projects, others are data models that come through that folks want to share with the world. Um, and so we tend to bucket them into um, three sizes of experimental, standard, and premium. Experimental could be one where a developer is uh, working on something at home in the basement and just wants to put it in GitHub to see if it garners any interest. Or maybe it's a data scientist that just wants to share a model with a small community. 
Um, that's okay. So long as they pass legal checks and security checks, the things like branding and roadmap, we can kind of set that aside. The next level up is a standard project. And this is where we would at least require something like a six month roadmap and a couple of project champions who have dedicated time as part of their job to uh, maintaining and supporting these projects. The next one would be our premium tier project. And these are uh, the projects that we expect to have hundreds to thousands of users um, and immediate, immediate impact to the community once the project is launched. Um, and these, these require a little bit more TLC and a little bit more level of effort here um, because we wanna make sure that uh, projects that have this much work put into them are getting the right, the right view, uh, or excuse me, are getting the right visibility into their project. So this is where um, groups like brand and marketing help us out. <clears throat> I wanna go through an example specifically. Uh, we actually uh, just launched a new project um, called CRIT, which is a command line interface tool for bootstrapping Kubernetes clusters. Um, and I just wanna talk about the engagement model between the uh, five, four, four or five teams here um, that went into the approval process to launch this project and make sure it was ready for launch. The first one being the development team who is uh, responsible for managing the code, um, their repositories, roadmap and documentation. Um, in addition, uh, making sure they have quality code, resolving any security and license findings, um, and then maintaining the community. Again, PRs, issues, um, and GitHub projects. Um, they're, they're responsible for maintaining the community. Um, they engage OSPO and our tech risk, who ensures that the proper scanning has been performed um, so that they can actually go ahead and resolve those findings. Um, we outline best practices for GitHub and how to manage their projects in GitHub. And we facilitate the formal process with our stakeholders to give a green light to launch the project. So um, we bring in risk, brand, and legal so that they don't have to make that touch point themselves. Legal, in this case, actually went ahead and worked one-on-one -on -one to help them um, either remediate or disposition their license findings. Um, so mo in uh, you know, most of these cases, there were findings that were able to be resolved rather quickly. And then in other cases, there might be um, use cases where we just need to accept a, a, you know, some low amount of risk. And legal helps the dev team um, make the right decision here for the project. Uh, they also make sure that we don't have any trademark violations when we launch a new project as far as the project naming convention. And then any other industry or patent risks out there that you know a developer may not be you know or may not have top of mind, um, they're there to cover off on that perspective. And lastly, brand and brand is particularly important um, for our larger projects. So they help assess the need for content marketing. Um, they do a ton of writing for us, and um, they are gearing up to do some content writing on Crit uh, as we speak. Um, they helped us with our internal and external communications. So also, you know, sharing the news inside the company. Um, and then lastly, um, they consult to develop storytelling. So um, with this one, again, they help us with things like, um, with, with like creative, where we go to conferences and events and uh, publish information and forums. Um, really anything that we're not prepared to cover off on ourselves from a marketing standpoint, they jump in. And so this project was recently launched and um, we can uh, uh, follow up if there are any questions on it. So um, again, going back to sweaty Steve Ballmer here, wanting to get his project into GitHub as soon as possible. Again, we're not, we're not looking for Steve to go and make friends with legal risk and brand, but we are looking for them to make friends with the open source program office so that we can introduce them um, and facilitate the right conversations because these stakeholders, you know, or these partners that you may not know you had, um, they're, not, they're not hurdles or roadblocks, right? They're actually the folks who want to remove barriers that you may not realize you have or that may come along down the road. Um, you know, so bring them in early and often, make that, the, um, make that partnership with your open source program office and we will help cover off on any of the grounds that you may not have thought of. And all of that, if you follow these steps, you're more likely to have a successful project in GitHub. Um, and the proof is in the pudding here. Um, Hygieia has been out for five years now. We're seeing it uh, continually grow as far as visitors, forks, stars. Um, you know, our, we have projects that our community is owning and driving. Um, and, you know, for, for five years to see um, a project that was immediately popular to still have an impact in the community has really, has really been awesome. And it's been without, uh, not possible without the help of our partners. In addition to um, those metrics, uh, we've also formed a consortium in 2018. Um, we realized there's a few uh, frequent contributors and core contributors 
um, you know, in a few different companies. And somebody asked a question, can we, can we even form a consortium? And this is one where we brought in uh, legal and said, hey, can we share information about what we're doing across companies? Legal helps us out, you know, to help understand what that blurred line is of not sharing, you know, your company secret sauce or um, collaborating in good spirit of the open source community. Um, so that's a, just another example where legal was able to lean in and help. And then brand did the storytelling of this uh, cross enterprise collaboration and more companies have joined the consortium as a result. So the point here is that good communities are not formed on accident. They take a lot of effort and a lot of effort from um, a lot of different people, whether that be your dev team, the product managers, marketers, content writers, lawyers, um, security advisors, you name it. So at the end, Steve Ballmer's happy because his project is far more successful than it would have been had he just kind of launched this on his own time. Uh, and Capital One's happy too because we're not exposing ourselves to any unnecessary risks. I'll quickly touch on the software foundations that we sponsor. So uh, many of them under the Linux Foundation. Um, so, and we also support Python Software Foundation and are part of the to-do to group and sponsor Apache Software Foundation. Um, and what I want to share is important here is that um, at the very least, um, you know, aside from just being a good steward in the community, we're dependent upon the software that these communities create. So we'd be crazy not to want to engage them, whether it be with thought leadership and participation, or if it's, um, you know, opening up the wallet, you know, and investing in those communities. Um, specifically this year, we've gotten more involved in the Continuous Delivery Foundation. Um, and I won't go through all these goals here, um, but I will say that we've had the opportunity to lead the end user council where we're facilitating sessions with several companies um, end user end user council members and guests um, to talk about what are the projects that they're facing in their delivery pipeline. Um, are we seeing similar problems, you know, as DevOps matures as a whole and DevOps matures at each company. And so this is very new, but we're excited about it. And if there's any interest, please be sure to follow up after this talk. And then this year, we're also really excited. We got to announce a couple months back that Cloud Custodian was successfully donated to the CNCF. Um, so frankly, Custodian outgrew Capital One and uh, we wanted to make sure that its next home had the proper guardrails, governance and reach to make this project continually successful. Um, so we did a lot of work this year to get this project ready for launch. Um, and, and proud to have them owning this now. With that, I'll pass it back to Noreen to kind of sum up um, key takeaways from today. Thank you, Tyler. Um, so the key takeaways, right? Um, ensure that you have identified the right key metrics, um, have a process to analyze, track, and report out compliance metrics so that you could have a faster compliance process, fewer license violations, and avoid security vulnerabilities. So track your contribution health is very important, whether you are going to be a, a more of a consumer or a distributor, right? Track, track the health of your scan results, of the commit PRs, and so forth. Know your partners, who they are in the company that will help you get to the strategic goals. Um, and a successful open source program offers. Collaborate, collaborate, and collaborate. Identify, um, again, I could not stress enough, like identify the partners that can help you, um, you know, establish a successful open source program office. So Tyler, anything else that I've missed out you want to add? No, I think that's a great summary. I'll just say, um, folks, you know, you've heard us say, you know, legal risk brand, um, you know, over and over again. And it, it might be more than these groups. You know, we also have internal audit that helps us test our controls. And it, the point I want to make here is that if, if you're not sure, uh, or I want you to try and put a face to the name of each of these groups, you know, think about who specifically in your company is someone you can reach out to um, and engage with. And then as Noreen mentioned, metrics are going to be so important to prove the point about why open source is important and why they should care. And if you can if you can prove that, they will be wildly helpful for you down the road. Um, as we wrap up here, I just want to point you guys to our open source landing page. Um, so this recently launched, and it's a place where you can uh, keep in touch with the projects we've launched and what we're doing in the open source space. Um, and it's a way for you to engage with us as well. So I invite you to check it out. And I want to thank you again. Um, so really thank you for your time. Um, I know there's a lot of sessions out there, so I'm glad you could you could attend ours. Um, find me in GitHub or shoot me an email if you have any questions. Yeah. Thank you. It's been a pleasure to present. Um, so if you have any questions, 
to reach out to us either through my GitHub account or Capital One. Uh, I did not see any questions yet in Q&A, um, but you know where to find us and do check out our um, webpage. Thank you. <laughs>